I'm having an epiphany. Holy f But now that I think about it, yeah. Ooh. Ooh, girl. I'm having the big hit. This video is epiphany. We're, woo. Do you have friendships where when you meet up, it feels like you're just catching each other up on what's happened in your life since you last spoke. Your relationship, your job, your family, maybe over dinner or coffee. But right when you finish this debrief, or maybe even before you finished, it's over. You have to catch the train or go back to work. And you never actually really get into anything deeper. And then you get your diaries out to schedule the next catch up and you realize next time you're both free is over a month away. Mm. Again and again and again. So I asked my patrons on Patreon and Discord, is this a thing that you've experienced? And so many people had. That is a catch-up friendship. The earliest use of this phrase I could find within mainstream discussions was a TikTok posted by user Infinite BS or mm. Bianca, with 2.6 million views. She describes the interaction as one where, before you know it, you've essentially spent 45 minutes interviewing each other like you're on a reality show without really breaking past the surface. It might not be a phrase that you've heard before, but it seems that many of us relate to it. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna say, I wonder about that, that idea of, oh, we're having a shallow conversation. But also I think it's how safe you feel in the relationship mixed in with how deep are you willing to go right away? Because I think one of the common issues neurodivergence run into is going too deep too fast in a lot of friendships. So I feel like the only time I don't go deep, even in a 10 minute conversation is when there's like a safety factor of some kind. Like I don't feel comfortable or maybe like I'm worried about sharing this vulnerability or maybe there's something like stopping us from going there. But in general, I feel like I'm in the category of neurodivergent where it's almost like like I'm too quick to go deep. You aren't in school anymore where your only responsibility is homework and a few chores before you can go play for hours with your friends. We just have less time, life moves on. What's wrong with grabbing coffee with a friend? At least we're staying in touch. But I think this one observation is a tip of an iceberg that hints at a looming dark mass beneath the surface. Because I'd already had conversations about this phenomenon of the catch-up friendship before, we just hadn't thought to name it. And now it was buzzing in the back of my brain. We kept seeing conversations about friendship in crisis everywhere. Articles about the effect of COVID on friendships, the subgenre of I have no friend YouTube videos. I will say if you're young, like if you're really young, and COVID happened while you were young, I'm assuming you're having a much different experience than somebody who's older, because obviously all my friendships were deeply established before COVID happened. So I had like an established friend group and none of those friends, I mean, maybe one or two of those friendships ended over COVID, but that was inevitable. I think most of my friendships stayed intact over COVID. I never thought much about it. I've never lived near my friends, you know, and when I have, which was nice, it only lasted temporarily since I've moved so much of my life. For me, I think I use the internet as a way to keep in touch with all my friends and I have for so many years. Prior to COVID, I don't think much about it. But I wonder if Gen Z can give me some info on that. Do you guys have some insight into what it was like being Gen Z through COVID? How communication stifled or stopped? And then how many of you are used to living in the same area as your friends? Friends. The panic of men's loneliness and mental health, the lack of third spaces to spend time socializing, TikToks of girls openly crying because no one showed up to their birthday dinners, and the confusion and isolation they felt because of that. You know, Fishy, you said, also I wonder, is it depth we are looking for or is it just looking to trauma dump? I feel like people's mistake trauma dumping with depth. I want to say that I, I do think, you know, I've had this conversation with friends, I've told you guys these stories where that's such an important conversation for me to have with the friends where I'm like, you need to go to therapy. Like it's getting to the point where like I have the right to reserve privacy about my life. And people are like, what? Like they, I think, I think, and I fall, I fall victim to this as well, where I, it feels like I'm so open that it feels like people think I'm not entitled to privacy or like I don't allow, like I'm not allowed privacy. And I really want to practice like re like reinf reinforcing those boundaries of I'm allowed privacy, even from my best friends. You know, I have such good boundaries with a lot of my friends that like I don't even know like some of what my parents like my friends make or like who they're dating. Like that's not my business. It is not my business if my friend is dating. Like they, if they want to tell me they're in a relationship, that's great. But like they're an adult. Like they get to live their life. You don't have to tell me if you change jobs. That's none of my business. <laughs> like 
But I think there's idea of like, you didn't tell me you changed your jobs. Like, I don't want that kind of friendship with people. If you want to tell me when you changed your job on your own timeline, that's great, bro. I don't need to be in your business. Like, I don't need to be up your butt. I'm not your wife. So I think sometimes friendships get a little uncomfortable because like you're used to sharing everything with your bestie only for there to come a moment where you're like, I'm not sharing everything with you. I hope you know that. I know when I was little, I thought there was a reality where you shared everything with someone, but the no, the truth is, is like, you're not supposed to. It's okay to keep things private, y'all. It's okay to keep things private. Fishy says, I really recently saw a short and the caption was POV, the friend who has never been traumatized. And the girl was literally just talking about all the positive things in her life uh, and had healthy boundaries. I do think people, I do think people have certain friends they also pick to trauma dump on. Like, have you ever realized you're the trauma dump friend? I've realized this. Where you, you're looking at the friendship you have and you realize like, oh, I'm the friend you come to when your shit is a mess. That's a bad friendship. I realized that the last few years I had someone who would only come to me when shit was a mess in their life. And I'm like, damn, like I'm the person you come to for advice. Well, to be fair, I was older, but it was one of those things where I'm like, okay, you're like, I'm that friend for you and I don't want to be that friend for you. And people take it hard because they expect you to do a lot of emotional labor for them. But I think a lot of people have to recognize like, oh, that's what's happening, huh? You only call me when your life's a mess. That sucks. When I was in school, my friendships felt profoundly intense. I endured years of bullying, but I also had a group of close-knit friends, probably pulled together by our shared unpopularity. These friendships solidified further as we entered our teen years and discovered many of us were queer or else were supportive enough for it not to matter to our friendships. We talked to each other about crushes and secrets and fears and hopes. We spent as much time together as we could, delighted in our shared interests. We created elaborate ideas for joint fan fiction projects that we never wrote. We were almost always touching, didn't think it odd or strange to hug or slump across each other or cuddle during sleepovers or sit curled together in the common room at school. But this type of tactile, emotionally vulnerable friendship is not universal. I recently spoke to a guy friend of mine about a topic that runs parallel to this video, the difference between romantic and platonic attractions, especially when sex isn't involved. It's something that I think about a lot as an asexual lesbian and Ooh, a topic I'm working Asexual lesbians in the chat, bro, let's go. Working on a whole video essay about for later this year. I've asked straight guys about this before and it usually kind of baffles them, but he replied almost instantly. I've always felt that the women I've known over the years, their friendships together, they honestly already feel romantic to me. For him, he explained, they contained the trust, vulnerability, and emotional depth that he associated with romance. Mm. And you know what? I don't think he's wrong. And immediately it called to mind the stereotype about men never getting over their first girlfriend. Not necessarily that they kept being in love with them, but that that relationship, the breakup and the fallout seemed to stay with them in a lasting way, even unconsciously. Because I realized almost all the women that I know have a similar experience that they can point to, not about a romantic relationship, but about a friendship from their youth. A girl who broke off their friendship or iced them out of a group or humiliated them in some way. I had that experience and I know it shaped a lot of my anxieties and self-worth when I was younger. Mm -hmm. As I was thinking about it, I realized that it made a lot of sense to me. That if a romantic relationship was the first time that these guys were experiencing the kind of tense emotional trust and vulnerability I had in these friendships, that the impacts might be similar. Now, generalizing about entire sexes or genders is, you know, not a good area to get into. And to be clear, I do not think that this type of friendship is in a biological imperative of being born with a womb. But in our cis-normative world where gender norms are very much enforced, I think there's something to explore here. So not wanting this video to be me just theorizing about my experiences of friendship, I decided to look at what the research said. Are there differences between how men and women experience friendship? And if so, why does this happen? And is this connected in some way to this friendship crisis that everyone's talking about? Why is this worth making a whole video essay about? I say it as if us video essayists need an excuse to make a video essay about something niche and unimportant. So maybe it's more, why should we care? Why should you care? William Rawlins, professor of interpersonal communication at Ohio University, for example, described it as including three key components. Somebody to talk to, someone to depend on, and someone to enjoy. Somebody to, okay, how friendships change in adulthood. Somebody to talk to, someone to depend on, and someone to enjoy. I'm going to say this out loud. I feel like the only, uh, I don't, you know, I'm going to say it out loud, but I'm, I'm brainstorming with you guys. I think the only defining difference to me between friendship and romantic relationship that is so significant 
is doing life together. So when you do life together, a lot comes with that. So it's not as like black and white, like there's only one difference. That one difference means there's like 20 differences. So I don't do life with my friends. I'm not interested in doing life with my friends. I've said this for many, many years, even all the way back in 2015. I remember one of my male friends and I argued about this in a very healthy way. We love to do that, where he was like, what do you mean you're not gonna do life with your friends? I was like, I'm not doing life with my friends. I was like, neither are you, bro, you know that. He's like, I ain't doing life with my friends. I was like, no, you would ditch your friends in a second for the right kind of job, but you're not gonna ditch your partner for the right kind of job, be real with me. And so like, maybe, maybe he ended up li living life with his friends, but for me, and I've been very very clear about this my whole life. I am not interested in doing life with my friends. I don't want to buy property with my friends unless we were strictly doing a business deal. I certainly don't want to travel with my friends in a very like consistent way. I, I don't know about you, but I've traveled with a few friends. It went great, but I definitely like, I don't want to be the person that like every year I meet up with a friend and like, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to make rituals around friendships in a way that makes me feel like oh, I'm gonna do this for 60 years. Like I'm not interested in making that kind of commitment to my friends. And at the same time, my friends and I usually on a yearly basis make plans. Like I'm about to hit my one year anniversary with one of my most like longest inner circle people. And uh, since I saw her, I saw her a year ago for our birthdays, cause our birthdays are in May, okay? Lots of birthdays in May, guys. And uh, I just hit her up and I was like, one year anniversary. And like, I haven't seen you in a year officially. And then we're gonna catch up this month to like celebrate as we do every year for our birthdays and for our friendship. But yet it doesn't feel like a yearly obligation. It's just something we go, hey, do you wanna catch up again? It's May. It's like versus thinking like, oh, we have to do this. And like, if we don't do it one year, it's like the end of our friendship. It's like, no, I wanna feel so secure in my friendships that if something changes, it doesn't ruin the friendship. Versus when you're doing life with someone, like truly doing life with someone, if you change something, well, we have to change together or it is gonna ruin something, right? To some extent, to some extent, to some extent, right? So some, I'm allowing some nuance there. My language is kind of like, you know, but I want I want there to be some nuance there. Whereas Dr. Diane Carson-Jones, a professor of educational psychology, described it as having the core provisions of intimacy, mutual assistance, and companionship. The American Psychological Association has a more dry definition, I'd say, where those involved tend to be concerned with meeting the other's needs and interests as well as satisfying their own desires. But I think one of the most clear and comprehensive is Mendelssohn and About's Six Elements of Friendship. One, stimulating companionship where you both participate in shared time and activities that you enjoy. Two, help or social support. This can be in the form of emotional support, financial or practical support, or support involving advice or ideas for how to deal with problems you may be facing. Three, emotional security, a sense of a trusting a friend with your safety, to have your back mm. as it were, even in different situations. Four, reliable alliance mutual and reciprocal shows of loyalty. Five, self-validation, a level of support that lifts up a friend's sense of self-worth. And six, intimacy, the ability to be honest about sensitive topics, feelings, and mm. fears. So we're looking at a relationship that's reciprocal, for some in a more emotionally intimate way, for others it's focused more on pleasure and enjoyment of their company. Mm -hmm. These similar but still distinct experiences of friendship are something I'm gonna be digging into later in this video. But for now, the important thing to know is that on a very obvious and basic level, a lack of meaningful friendship is a path to loneliness. Mm -hmm. You can be- I think it's, uh, I think it's your Harvard or Yale. I was just watching a TikTok on it. it said something like the oldest study in American history has been done on intimate relationships why people live long and the answer was basically like relationships like intimate friendships and relationships is like the number one contributing factor to like long lives which is interesting right made it says humans um have the capacity for doing life with a select number of people that number varies from person to person i think long-term friendships are beautiful when they emerge naturally i mean gosh i'm so grateful for my long-term friendships i mean i'm so grateful for them they're lovely and i think they work so well because we're so similar um, and a lot of our desires, like none of them want to do life with me. It's not like they want to build their life with me. Right. So I think that mutual compatibility is, is also necessary in friendships is to have sort of a mutual compatibility, compatibility with that. Yeah. Because if any of my inner circle, like was like, I want to do life with you. I'd be like, well, I'm confused because none of us do life together. None of my siblings, none of my friends, like that's not interesting to any of us. And so, yeah, I think there's something to that. Fishy says, wait, I actually saw a short about friendships. The girl was saying it's okay to ask your friend for a ride to the airport, even LA, even at rush hour, and that she's going to start asking friends for favors because she's willing to do those favors and she wanted to encourage more people to ask for them, for those in her life. And it was fascinating. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because that balance of like, when is it appropriate to ask someone to take you to the airport versus just taking an Uber 
it's just dependent. It's just dependent. Like if I'm going to already pay my friend to take me to the airport, I might as well take an Uber. You know, if I'm going to because I don't let like my friends will just take me to the airport. Usually I give them money or if not money, then, you know, like lunch or something. Or if not that, then it's got to be someone close to me. Like if my siblings take me to the airport, I'll like fill up their gas tank or something. You know what I mean? Because it's a pain to leave at 4 a.m., go to the airport. You know, that's a pain in the butt. So I usually like pay them back somehow. I'm like, take me to the airport, bro. I'll pay your gas. Come on, take me to the airport. I'll fill up your tank, you know, because you don't it's annoying to like ask someone to wake up at four in the morning to take you when you don't even want to go. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, but at the same time, like I'm happy to do things for my friends. But I also have had friends that take advantage of you, too. Hmm. It's hard because sometimes like people be out here taking advantage. So how do you say I'm available, but don't take advantage of me? Because people have different like ideas of what is not taking advantage of somebody. So even with friendships, you got to negotiate consent boundaries, you know? Interacting with different people as part of your job for the majority of the day. So you aren't alone, but that loneliness can still persist with a lack of friendship. If we're seeing a rise in concerns about loneliness, we'd expect for either something to be causing that increase or for admitting to it to be more acceptable or accessible, exposing a loneliness that has been there all along. Last year, a worldwide Metagallup survey, which looked at a thousand people from each of the 170 countries that were studied, found 24% felt very or fairly lonely, with a further 27% feeling a little lonely. Although there isn't a direct comparison to how these people felt in previous years to see if there's been an increase. I found a research article named Loneliness Across Time and Space by Makey Lerman, which aimed to look at loneliness across larger time spans. And they found data on loneliness from representative samples from the past century are almost non-existent. Mm. This conclusion is drawn in part due to the fact that loneliness as a measure that was standardized in longitudinal studies is fairly recent, although I did find some smaller sample size examples. In England, the Annual Community Life Survey, a nationally representative annual survey of those 16 years and older, suggests that young adults aged between 16 and 24 had their rate of feeling often or always lonely rise from 8% to 10% between 2017 and 18 and 2021 to 22. But whether this loneliness is new or increasing or just something that people feel more able to open up about, the potential physical and mental effects for the individual remains similarly worrying, with evidence of rises in mental health issues, feelings of stress and a decline in general well-being. From a physical health point of view, the link might not seem obvious on the surface. Loneliness is a mental state, right? But our internal psychological experiences can have a profound effect on our body. The expression worrying yourself sick is not without scientific backing. Stress hormones such as cortisol build up over the long term with chronic periods of stress and isolation, increasing the risk of a variety of health concerns. The research review Adult Friendship and Wellbeing, a systemic review of practical implications, compared results from research articles from 2000 to 2019. Individuals of all ages report being happier when they are with friends than when they are alone or with family members, and mm. friendships are viewed as the most common source of joy. The presence of friendship ties is also associated with a variety of positive health outcomes such as lower mortality rates and a relatively long life. Okay, that's really interesting to me for a few reasons. I do think that makes sense to say that our friendships for some people are going to be closer than our family. Because one, I think of friendships as like chosen family, which is a very specific decision to make. And also we often pick friends we're comfortable with versus family we learn to be comfortable with. And so I think there's probably a difference there. And that would make a lot of sense to me, especially if you don't have a large family, then most of your joy will come from friendships probably because just like numbers wise, you'll have more options. So I think that's really interesting. In a more expansive sense, a lack of personal friendship one-on-one -on -one can also lead to a lack of sense of belonging internally, as well as access to the practical positives of a community. Having people to gather around who you can depend on, who are able to lend a hand or advice or support when something goes wrong. And this is a cycle that seems to keep running. The absence of the very community who will be able to be there for you when you have feelings of loneliness and depression or lower self-esteem is a big part of those feelings in the first place. Having no friends is often seen as more than just a problem to fix. It's also perceived as a moral failing, a source of deep embarrassment or pity, a personal ineptitude that says something very real and frightening about you. We see this in how desperate and embarrassed or else how defiantly honest people are who open up about their loneliness online. Because it's not just the people that are experiencing this loneliness. 
It's also that there's an inability to express and communicate those feelings in a way that feels like it will be respected. Okay, Tanya made a great point. Says, my dad passed away a couple years ago. I'm sorry about that. My parents always had friends, but it really made me look at friendship differently. It made me realize how important my friends, my parents' friends were. They really showed up. I think I would see that if my when my parents pass. I, will, I think I will see their friends show up. And I appreciate the friendships they've had for many, 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 many years. I mean, my parents have friendships that are as old as their children, right? Like they've known people for over 40, 50 years, you know? So it is kind of very impressive, those kinds of friendships. I think there's something to be said about like, what would you be willing to do? I think about this all the time. Like I have strong boundaries with my family and friends. Like, okay, your best friend, they get into a car accident and are paralyzed. Do you take them in? Do you take care of them? What if they have no family and friends to take care of them themselves? Are you their family and friends? I will say that there seems to be a difference to me a little bit just because of resources. What would make sense? Like most of like my inner circle best friends, they're, they're all financially secure and they all have resources and I think they should be fine. But some of my siblings don't have that same sort of like security in the same way. So if one of my siblings became ill, like how would that impact my life? Would I take them in? Would I take care of them? Depends on the sibling because I'm not going to let my house be burdened with energy. So, you know, I think about that responsibility. Like my friends are good. Like even my, my, just all my, I, all the friends I'm thinking of, like all of them have friends or family or jobs or health insurance. Like they should all be fine. I don't think I have a friend in my life that I can think of that I'm worried about falling ill because I think they all have resources from my memory. I can't think of anyone that might not, but I definitely have some little siblings that aren't quite established yet, but then their resources would be their older siblings or their parents. So there's also that where like in my family, I am considered a resource. So the question is, you know, how far are you willing to go for your your friends? Now, with that said, I think and this is just my bubble. I obviously wouldn't question any of this when it came to my partner. So when it came to my partner, it's like, what are we even talking about? Of course, I would take care of him. Of course, I would be everything he needed if he was like paralyzed. Like I wouldn't even think about it. Right. Like, of course. But we hesitate with friends and family, which again is my argument about making a life with your friends or family. When I say like, I don't live life with you, like if I got paralyzed, I wouldn't expect my best friend to take care of me because like that's not what they signed up for. I would just figure out how to be hyper independent or I would ask my family, not because family and friends aren't as important, but because of just the way the structure works, that's how it worked for us. But I wouldn't say that's not how it would work for somebody else, but just the way that life went for us, it would make more sense for my sister to take care of me if my husband wasn't alive for some reason, then for my best friend to take care of me. It just, it would make more sense. And I'm not sure if that's just, I don't think it's a blood related thing. I think it's actually just the way our life went. Like the way our lives are set up, it would just make more sense for my sister to take care of me or to help me. I think that would just make more sense for everybody. I think everybody would be happier that way. Mm, so that's also the question is, how would everyone be happier? I think my sister would be fine with it. I'd be fine with it. Assuming my husband's dead, of course, because like obviously. And then I think my best friend would feel better about it too. So it's kind of interesting, like this idea of friends and romantic relationships and like what is the point of a friendship? I think a friendship is very, very important. I think your friends are very important. I think the role they play is very important. I just think it's specific and with boundaries like any other relationship. Alex says casual friends. Mm, see, acquaintance, casual friend, friend, inner circle. That's my hierarchy. So I think there's acquaintances for Brittany, casual friends, friends, inner circle friends. So I prefer my friends and my inner circle friends. Those are the people that I care about the most. Casual friends are nice, but I don't care about them as much. And acquaintances are, you know, a community members that I feel an obligation to and I care for out of that obligation. Hold on, Tanya says, I think people downplay how important having an acquaintance can be. Every friend doesn't have to be best friend. I think some are too focused on needing to be close with anyone in their community. True, true. The infamous we need to talk line is so well known for a reason. It's expected that you'll have conversations about the relationship itself. But how do you ask someone if you're friends? How do you define the type of friendship that you have? Ooh. How do you have conversations about the friendship? If we acknowledge that romantic relationships take work, that you might have fights, but you work through it, that you have this ability to express a commitment to each other, why do we most often treat friendships so differently? A lack of labels or specific language wouldn't be a problem if we encouraged a system of open communication within the friendship journey, but for many people, both are lacking. And so we're left with this so-called friendship crisis, people who feel unfulfilled in their social lives, who crave types of friendship that they seem unable to form, who are left devastated by friendships ending yet don't know how to talk about it without being seen as overreacting. How does gender then 
play into this. Friendship and gender expectations. Mm -hmm. My friend's comment about the women in his life having before I go into that, perfect timing. Izzy says I was bullied for two years in middle school by my best friend girl group and it had such a huge impact on me. Female friendships in particular feel dangerous. They feel deeper. I was bullied by my first cousin and a girl. And I was like, oh my God, you broke girl code. But more than that, it does feel deeply like it was deeply traumatizing for years i was deeply traumatized over this betrayal i was so confused by it i remember calling my dad at 7 30 in the morning because he had just dropped me off for school and i remember saying you have to come pick me up you have to come pick me up she told a horrible rumor about me and now everybody is coming up to me and like questioning me about something i have no idea what they're talking about i'm so confused my dad comes and picks me up from school and drives me home and I'm just crying. And I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. She's telling people I did a horrible thing and I have no idea. And I'm freaking out because I was just like so confused. And I told myself, because I had just come out to her as queer, I had just come out to her and I said she was the last girl in the friend group I told that I was gay because I was worried. I had a feeling. I was like, she's not going to handle it well. And she said, oh, she's like, I accept you. Everything's good. I was like, okay, you sure? And she was, I was, so I was dating a girl at the time and I was so, or just before I had just broken up with her in high school, we were holding hands, everybody relax. But you know, I knew, I knew. And then I told her and boom. Anyways, how frustrating, huh? Canon. It's just Canon. It's Canon. Part of your story. You know what I mean? It's got to happen. I think, you know, we've all been bullied <laughs> at some point. That's when I went back on independent study. That's why I've only done two years of high school. Cause I came in as a fresh or uh, a sophomore, did junior year and left my senior year after I got bullied out of high school. Cause I was like, I can't go to school. All my friends think I did a horrible thing. And it was the, per the ringleader was my cousin uh, who to this day, she denies ever doing it. So mental health is real, bro. I think partly like buoyed by the whole straight people obsession with can men and women really be friends nonsense. The idea of gender divides in friendship are already in- And by the way, this does not ruin my friendship with women. Like two of my inner circle best friends are girls. A lot of my best friends are girls. I love girls, love women, love men, love non-binary people. Regardless of gender, I have great relationships with people. Sometimes, funny enough, the men in my life are the biggest headaches in my life because they're so dramatic. Actually, I'll tell you this, the biggest fights I've been in with people are mostly men because men are incredibly traumatized and stigmatized. When I told my female friends to get therapy, they were like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Thank you for telling me and got therapy. When I tell my male friends to get therapy, they get offended. They literally get offended. And I'm like, you need to grow up. But that's because like they don't think about their trauma dumping or like the emotional labor that you're making them do. They don't think about it in the same way as your female friends. So props to my female friends who were like, oh my God, I'll totally get therapy. Thanks for letting me know. Versus my male friends that are like, what the fuck? I don't need therapy. Bro, you need therapy. That's why you're being inappropriate with me right now because you forgot that I'm your friend. You're being inappropriate. Hello. Incidentally, men and women can be just friends if they aren't fucking weird about it. One of the True. key differences, which seems to arise over and over, was the idea of intimacy. In the study Friendship and Gender Perspectives of Professional Men and Women, Dr. Linda A. Sapodin found that results indicated that while both sexes viewed the characteristics of an ideal friendship in similar ways, their actual experiences of friendships differed. Women's same-sex friendships were rated higher for overall quality, mm -hmm. intimacy, enjoyment, mm -hmm. and nurturance. Mm -hmm. That struck me as particularly interesting. The hypothetical components of friendship are agreed upon by everyone, but the experience and practice can differ. There was a study back in 1988 on the gender differences between American and New Zealand adults, gender differences and friendship patterns by Richard Orquette. By reissuing a survey originally done in a US college to students in New Zealand, he hoped to look at the differences and similarities there. Ooh, Izzy says my amazing Male friendships are easier if they're surface level annoying if you get deep because they require so much emotional labor i'll say this too and no no offense to any of the men in my life i'm so sorry but you have to get over it they take things so much more personal than the women in my life like if the women in my life are fucking up and i tell them like i don't like what you're doing i think you're fucking up like they'll just like agree to disagree or they will literally be like you're right i am fucking up and like it's fair like i get it the men are so much more stubborn the men are so much more stubborn. They just cannot handle the fact that they're fucking up. It's amazing. Or they can't agree to disagree. And I'm like, you have to do one or the other. You have to do one or the other. Because like, again, you have to either agree to disagree, like you think my assessment's wrong and we move on, which I've done with plenty of my friends. Or, you know, it's one of those things where I think women are so much more open to uh, conventional ways of 
healing that they're like, when I say go to therapy to my female friends, they don't see it as an insult. They hear me saying what it is. You're putting too much emotional labor on me. I'm so sorry. I'm your friend. I'm not doing life with you in that way. I think sometimes you're being inappropriate. Like, you know, I have, put, I put down a very hard boundary with people in my life about like what I'm doing, you know, with certain things. It's like, you can't, you can't cross this boundary. And if you cross this boundary, I'm going to ask you to go to therapy or I'm going to ask you to mind your own fucking business. And I think sometimes, I think friendships, especially male friendships, I think they forget. I have a, oh my God, I have a girlfriend of mine who's having the same issue with one of her male friends right now where he like doesn't understand why she's asking him to clean up after himself when he visits. Like I have a girlfriend of mine and like her male friend will come visit for like a hangout and he'll leave the house a mess. And she's like, um, I'm going to need you to pick up after yourself because like you literally leave my house and I have to clean. And he was just like, what? Like he had no idea. Like he would leave like food on the floor. And I'm like, and I think about that all the time. I think about the way like sometimes men feel like big children. And I'm like, hey, just a reminder. No. Or I've had male friends like cross boundaries in the weirdest way possible that I'm like, what are you doing? We're like, they seek like comfort in like a sexual manner. And I'm like, why are you seeking comfort for me in this way when we've never been sexual? Why are you doing this? And they're like, I don't know, dude. I just need a girl right now. I'm like, but I'm not just a girl. I'm your friend. So like picking me to be the girl you have casual sex with feels weird. We've never been sexual. Why would you pick me? Why wouldn't you go to another girl you're sexually active with or a girl that's like a higher sex worker? Why would you come to me? That's like coming to your bro. Hey, bro, can you like me off? I'm feeling really bad about myself. Like, why would you cross that boundary with your friend who you've never been sexual with? Because you're in a bad mood. Like, you're sad. It's just interesting. It's just fa fascinating to me, I think. So I don't know. Maybe I've been very lucky with girls as much as I had bad problems when I was a teenager. My adult friendships were like about equal men, women. If people made drama, they made drama regardless of gender. But I will say right now, I feel like my female friendships are incredibly rewarding. My male friendships are also rewarding. A little bit more complicated sometimes. But for the most part, just, you know, gender doesn't seem to play that much of a role depending on the issue. Depending on the issue. But yeah. They definitely, yes, Izzy, they're hella emotionally stunted, so they require you to soften criticism so much. Don't even get me started. And the worst part is like when they come to lecture me, that's my biggest pet peeve is when they come to lecture me and I'm like, this is it. no, I did not ask you to have an input on my life. The, the way they feel entitled to making commentary on your life, and I'm like, J -j -j -j. no, I don't want your opinion. And they're like, what the fuck? But like, I have an opinion I want to, no, no, shush. The entitlement to you thinking I need to hear your input right now. No, no. My life is way better off. It's it's like people with toxic relationships trying to give me romantic advice. I'm like, J -j 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 -j. I do not want to hear your input. Thank you. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Absolutely not. The way people in my life try to give me advice when they are literally worse off. I, J -j 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 -j. I only, no, no. I want to hear from people that are doing better than me. Not worse. Research suggesting that women are more intimate and emotional in their same-sex friendships than men and tend to place a higher value on these friendships than men do. In accordance with the findings of the American sample, New Zealand women emphasize talking, emotional sharing, and discussing personal problems with their same-sex friends. Men, in contrast to women, derived emotional support and therapeutic value more from their opposite-sex relationships than their same-sex friendships. It isn't that men are finding intimate friendships less fulfilling, clearly this is something they value highly when evaluating their own experiences. So why is the difference in gendered attitudes to friendship occurring? A lot of research I found involved a similar set of questions and scenarios, essentially asking people to rate the behavior of a hypothetical friend in a variety of situations, mm. from friends canceling plans to a friend refusing to confide in you emotionally. These types of scenarios have been used across different countries and age groups, with notable differences between the responses from participants of different genders. In one research article, Gender and Friendship Norms Among Older Adults by Diane Felmley and Ara Morocco, they looked at the results for 135 adults with an average age of 73 years and found women rated a friend who disclosed a secret as more inappropriate than did men. 
Women also expressed more disapproval of a friend who did not stand up for them when someone was critical of them. Oh. Suggesting the expectations of friendship, particularly perceived loyalty in this case, differed between the two groups. Similar results were found in another piece of research by Felmley on college students on the other end of the age spectrum called gender rules, same and cross-gender friendship norms. Women tended to have relatively high expectations for their friendships, whether with other women or men, results consistent with those of other studies on ideal friendship standards and expectations. Expectations. But where do these expectations come from? I think the crux of our experiences with friendship and loneliness may well be tied to the way that we're encouraged and discouraged to form friendships as we grow up, particularly the way gender norms shape that area of our lives. The comparison from before about this idea of straight men never really getting over their first proper relationship, and how myself and many women I know growing up had the same long-lasting effects from friendship, I think it's not a wild jump to see these both as essentially the same experience. Someone being allowed to be emotionally vulnerable, trusting and intimate with someone outside their family, often for the first time. It's just that girls are potentially allowed that type of connection from friendship at an earlier age. I think about the way we structure play for boys and girls. Boys are encouraged to take up team sports, to play video games together, to build alongside each other. They're funneled into this path of making friends with bonding over shared experiences. Girls, on the other hand, are giving this image of the conversational tea party or the secret sharing sleepover. It's not just that on an individual level, girls are permitted to show vulnerable emotions more than boys. It's that that concept is baked into the ways we're taught to socialize mm. together at all. I wonder if power dynamics play a role. Because I've had lots of friends over the years, younger or older, um, even from sibling dynamics. I feel like when my... I could be wrong. This could be a wrong thought, but I'll brainstorm with, it, with you. I think my female friends when we seek advice out from one another or we're having a conversation we do not look at one another as older or younger or power dynamic -y. I'm having an epiphany holy fuck I think a lot of the men that have been in my life oh I think they might see themselves as smarter than me misogyny is real because I now in hindsight when I relive these conversations as she's talking the men I'm making a generalization I think they think they're giving oh I think that's why I had an Oh my God, I'm having an epiphany. I don't think my girlfriends and I ever think about being each other's like mentors or anything or like older than them. But the men, generally speaking, not all the men, just some of the men that I've had issues with, maybe they don't know how to like talk to you like an equal. And that's why it feels inappropriate because it feels like they feel obligated to like tell you something about yourself from like a I know better perspective versus a peer perspective oh it oh we little bitches oh that's such a dick move but that's kind of what i'm thinking now that i think about my girlfriends that are also having problems with their guy friends not all of them of course but the ones they do have problems with yeah it's like this it's like they're they're oh mm, my feminist is coming out oh Keep, oh, I got to swallow her back in. Yeah, there's like this. Um, I know you better than you know yourself. I see something you don't see. There's a lot of like almost gaslighting where I'm like, eh, shush versus my girlfriends. Like I fully trust my girlfriends to figure their shit out. But if they tell me they're good, they're good. Like figure it out, bro. But like, yeah, sometimes I think the boys, even the younger boys I know, they might get it in their heads that they know better. I'm going to spank all of them. Oh, I'm going to spank all of them for sure, bro. Kay says, yeah, that's definitely a man thing. They're taught. I see it all the time and it's so dumb and performative to me. It's like, what the fuck? Mira says, yes, I believe this. Every man I trust does uh, do this to me seemingly unintentionally. Yeah. Now that I think about it, I'm like, oh, this has been like a major fight. They, yeah, they treat you like you're kind of fucking dumb. And I'm like, wait a second. What? Even though I compete in the same market they compete in sometimes. Not literally the same like job or anything, but you know what I mean? Like the same world. That's so fascinating. Oh, <gasps> but little bitches, bro. That's why I got to put down boundaries. Like, nah, nah, shush. I don't want your opinion. Be quiet. Because it feels that way. It feels like you're lecturing me. Like, what are you, my mom? If I want to be lectured, I'll call my mother. I don't need to be lectured by my friends. Okay? Like, I do not lecture my friends unless they ask specifically for Britney lecturing. Otherwise, you're an adult. I trust you. Figure it out. Kenny says, one, one, uh, oh my gosh, once I realized most of the guys in my life see me as a dumb blonde, everything in our interactions made sense. They really fucking think they know better. Yeah, bro, I'm, I'm telling you right now I'm seeing a pattern. Stephanie says, I wonder if boys play more games 
that are more that are more structured and rule based football, basketball versus girls playing more imaginary world building like Barbies can explore their creativity. Good point. I think that does contribute. Ingrid says, I call my friends, my older sisters, but like I don't let them hold that over my head. I don't like being babied. Yeah, because like ultimately like we're we're in adult friend groups. That's why I don't like age gap relationships because you're treating your partner like they're dumber than you. Who wants to treat their partner like they're dumb? Like, why are you marrying these big teenage boys and being like, my husband's so stupid. I have to take care of him. Or these men are like, she's so sweet. Look at her figuring out life. That's how I feel with friendships. Once I get the feeling in a friendship, like you're treating me like I'm dumb in a way that is like not reasonable. That's frustrating to me. Because there's an allowance for like, oh, I'm just going through a moment right now. But I, I never think my friends are dumb. Like, I never think to look down on my friends, even when I disagree with them. But now that I think about it, I think that, yeah. Ooh. Ooh, girl. Ooh, yes, the mansplaining rasp. It's the mansplaining. It's like, ma'am. And I know, I know they're not trying to be evil about it, right? Like, I know they're not trying to be, like, malicious. You know, I think they're just trying to be helpful, but the hell to, the road to hell is paved in good intentions. Like genuinely keep it like I've really been trying to practice privacy moving into this year for that reason where I'm like, do you understand how inappropriate it is to come to your adult friend and be like, I disagree with your own beliefs. You should change them because I feel like if you thought like I did, you'd be better off. Like this is so inappropriate. Like you are being so inappropriate. And so I'm trying to put down more boundaries this year where I'm like, I do not need to think like you. I'm good where I like how I see the world. And if I change, I change. But yeah, the amount of weird energy I've had from men that are like, I think, you know, I think something's going on with you because you don't agree with me. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? I've never thought to do this to any of my friends. Like something must be wrong with them because we don't agree. Like what is happening? Yeah. Okay. That's really interesting. I'm fascinated. I'm absolutely fascinated. Talking might happen in these active boy pastimes, but it isn't the point of them. The point is the shared activity. And although there are plenty of girls in sports and who play games, this doesn't necessarily replace the social- No, literally, I'm sorry. I'm having like the biggest epiphany right now, which is so stupid. Like, of course this is true, but yeah, think about it. Think about all the men, even on the internet that have come across my work and they're like, Oh, Brittany doesn't know. Like, Brittany doesn't know the differences. Like, Brittany, it's her borderline. Like, oh, Brittany doesn't know. I'm like, we just disagree. Are you guys all fucking mental? Like, we just disagree. But then I'm realizing, like, yeah, there's like a, if we disagree, it's because you're dumb and I have the right answer. And I'm like, what? That's, what? That's not. <laughs> I feel like I'm having an epiphany. I feel like I'm gonna, oh my God. The idea of men as leaders and women as nurturers, girls as cooperating and boys as competing. There are so many layers of stereotypes that are pushed onto us that can inform the ways that we experience friendship from the very start of our ability to construct friendships at all. And I think we can see ways that this follows us into adulthood. That study on older adults I talked about before had one significant scenario where women were more lenient than men, mm -hmm. namely when a friend in clear emotional distress would not confide their feelings. On the surface, this seems like men wanting to encourage emotional connection, but the study also took note of the participants' reasoning for their answers. And for these men, it turns out, it wasn't really about emotional connection at all, but more a practically minded frustration. They believe that friends should talk about their problems so they can come to their aid. <laughs> it's better I know about her trouble, stated one male respondent. I may be able to help. For women, this scenario appeared to raise norms of patience and acceptance of a friend's negative emotions, as well as norms of respect for privacy. Male respondents, on the other hand, seem to be more disapproving of a friend who does not share their troubles because they want to be able to help or fix the situation as soon as possible. Thus, women's responses tended to reflect norms of nurturance and acceptance, whereas those of men depicted a more active helping orientation. That is literally why I've been putting down boundaries this year for more privacy. Because this happens where I'm like, you're being incredibly inappropriate right now. And I need you to back the fuck off. And my female friends obviously back the fuck off because they would never even think to bring it up in the first place. But the male friends are like, let me fix your problems. And I'm like, I don't have problems for you to fix. My life is great. And they're like, no, I think you do. It's like, they even look for problems to solve that aren't there. Oh my God, I'm having like the biggest epiphany ever. They will look for problems to fix that aren't even there. And then with, oh my God, I'm having like the biggest, I'm having the, mind your business. 
Mind your business. Could you imagine seeing like a successful person living their best life and being like, I think you need my help. I'm having the big, this video is epiphany world. Woo. So in fact, these results run in line with this delineation of friendship and gender that we've already seen before. And crucially, this connects with findings from other studies around the impact of the different elements of friendship, <laughs> looking at the difference between emotional and instrumental support. Because although both are important elements of friendship, it was also found that providers' emotional support, e.g. empathy, and instrumental support represent distinct dimensions of support provision. Crucially, emotional support, but not instrumental support, consistently predicted provider well-being. These two dimensions also interacted, such that instrumental support enhanced well-being of both providers and recipients, but only when providers were emotionally engaged while providing support. So when both people are emotionally engaged, then well-being increased. But if there was an emotional distance or detachment, then the friend getting the advice or practical support might have increased their well-being, but the same could necessarily be said for the person giving it. That activation of empathetic connection, even in the form of practical help, was key. The question then becomes, even if men are more equipped to give practical support, are they allowed? Okay, wait, wait, wait. You guys are in chat are talking about the differences between being a fix-it friend and a listening friend. Look, even I have fallen into this trap of being like a fix-it friend because I love problem solving, but I do not look for problems in people's life to then call them and solve it. I mean, I got to the point with some male friendships where men would like call me and be like, hey, I want to fix this thing in your life. And I'm like, I don't need you to fix anything in my life. I'm chilling. And they're like, no, I think you need to fix this thing because I think if you thought more like me, you'd come to the same conclusion. Therefore, I need to fix you and I'm like um no I've had this happen with a few male friends usually very smart people usually very independent in their own way but usually dated younger women <gasps> I'm seeing a pattern oh my god there's like three people in my head right now and all of them had a similar pattern dated women much younger than them were highly independent often neurodivergent worked with like IT or tech or something like that or slash uh boy jobs like nerd like boy jobs like all boys, like like not a female dominated arena. I'm thinking about, oh, this guy in Seattle I knew. It's tech bro to the T, same pattern, same pattern. I was wondering why I was running into a couple of people with this type of personality. And it was actually kind of pissing me off because I was like, why are you in my business? And I'm realizing now like it makes a lot of sense because they probably are really dependable. They probably do have a lot of insight. They probably do and are problem solving, but they, they're so neurodivergent. I think sometimes they don't know they're being incredibly inappropriate. I've never had a woman do this to me. What are you doing? But I think it comes from their need to like fix something. Yeah, that's so interesting now if somebody comes to me with advice girl i've been thinking about your problem this is how i would solve it you know it's not like that i'm not thinking about it i just wouldn't go to you and i certainly don't think like a difference of politics i had a friend reach out to me who's like hey i don't like your political opinion and i think like you're wrong and i want to help you be more right and i was like does more right mean like agreeing with you and they're like well i have the more right stance and i was like no thank you because like again i do not call my religious family up to try to change their opinions you have to understand i no, like, no, I trust you as an adult to come to your conclusions. I do not call my friends up to say, I really didn't like the way you voted last election. Let me tell you how you were wrong. No, that is so inappropriate for me to go to anybody in my life without us having a natural conversation to be like, Hi, I need you to change the way you voted. Like, no, I radically accept that my friends and family will vote differently than me, that people in my life will vote differently. It is not my business how you vote. It is only my business in regards to myself. Can you even imagine? I'm having like the biggest epiphany right now. Fing says, isn't it? Fingrit says, is it not? Is it just not a problem to say men are like this and women are like this? Don't think. Doesn't it make it worse? Okay, men are like this and women are like this. Well, we're obviously talking about certain bubbles. We're not talking about four. We're not talking about 8 billion people on the planet, right? We're talking about specific bubbles of men. Obviously, there are men in my chat right now agreeing with us because we're talking about different kinds of men, different kinds of women. So if you're new to my channel, we don't make generalizations. We would never speak for most men or most women. So what we're saying is in this bubble where we're at, the men in our life who do these actions are this way. My dad is in this way. When I'm talking, I'm never talking about my dad. My dad doesn't do this. My dad minds his business. My dad's a very private person. To hear the rest of my response, join YouTube memberships. This will give you access to special emojis, behind the scenes videos, and full unedited live streams. Thank you so much for supporting the content. Ultimately, these gendered encouragements to do friendship in the correct way for your gender, to perform gender through your most intimate connections with fellow human beings, is harmful 
available to everyone. I thought that this video would be strictly about women's friendship and loneliness when I first started to research, but then my findings started to drift into the impact on men as well, and it seemed to be a reasonable focus on the surface looking at this heavily gendered conversations about friendship on the internet. There was a world where I sort of ended the video around here, but while I was researching and discussing the topic with friends, I kept finding these other elements of our lives that seemingly were having huge impacts on friendship, mm. which intertwined with gender in many ways, that I needed to bring in to fully understand what is happening here. The modern practicalities of friendship. So let's think about a week in a typical adult life. It probably consists of working, commuting, feeding ourselves, and then keeping up with life admin. And for some of us, taking care of family or pets or children. Where do friendships fit into an already busy and overwhelming week? In an essay titled The Friendship Problem, Rosie Spinks writes about how friendships are starting to feel strikingly similar to admin, that we make oh. plans with people ages in advance scheduled around work and kids and chores and travel, and then more often than not, they get cancelled or rescheduled right before. She talks about how our adult friendships that are scheduled and planned are somehow failing to be the fulfilling intimate relationships that we desire because we're lacking the week-to-week -week boring consistency that is required to maintain and sustain connection and community and closeness. I was talking to a friend in Canada who told me about her grandma being part of a women's group. Every week they would rotate around to a different house. They had no agenda other than just hanging out. They might work on crafts, they might chat, they might do charity work together, but overall the goal was just to have a weekly gathering with no point other than enjoying each other's company. Well, this was a different era, these women were working in the home, but it did make me think about how this kind of weekly connection is absent from a lot of our lives. It's this kind of routine gathering for no good reason other than just to spend time together that's seemingly missing from a lot of our lives that makes me wonder if part of the catch-up friendship phenomenon has to do with the way we've turned hanging out, not just into admin, but into a kind of business meeting, scheduled and penciled into our calendars mm. with a... Okay, but I will say, I will say, I think there's an appropriateness to this that I think is really missing from the conversation. I do, I do, I had this problem with some friendships where they were like, I just want to be able to call you in the middle of your day and not have to schedule you in. And I was like, I would love that to be the case because I've definitely been of that available in the past. I'm just not that available uh, at this stage in my life. And it was hard on some friendships for sure to have that conversation. I think they felt definitely rejected, but eventually they either got used to it or some people just got a little grumpy and, um, you know, it is what it is. Um, but I think people want to feel, see, in one way, it's they want to feel the lack of pressure and they want to feel organic. But in another way, it's just entitlement. I feel entitled to call you whenever I want and have you answer the phone. But also, I understand the desire to say like, oh, like you would pick up the phone if I called. Yes, but like what is happening in life right now? And then also like it, when growing up, I was really lucky that, you know, usually if people wanted to hang out, they would be like, hey, you want to like meet? Like if my bestie and I, who, the one I grew up with most of my life, if she and I had kids at the same time and then lived in a similar neighborhood, yeah, we would see each other every week and we would like bring the kids around. But both she and I decided to focus on our careers and we haven't had kids. So obviously our jobs come first, which means that neither of us can just call each other whenever we want and talk because we're focusing on our jobs right now. Literally, even the other day I hit her up. I was like, Hey, are you free this Sunday to talk? She goes, let me look at my schedule, but I think I have a thing. And she like never got back to me because like we've known each other for 20 something years. And I know that just means she's busy and there's no reason my brain took it personal. I was like, oh, okay, she's busy. That's, I've known this girl so long. I literally didn't even think about it. I ended up like cleaning my house and hoping like we didn't have a call because I was like now in cleaning mode. But that's friendship. Friendship is being like literally so secure that you not getting back to a text message doesn't feel like abandonment or you understand that like you're busy. Like my friendship is so secure with this woman that I, I didn't even think about it. I just thought it was funny. I was like, I'm doing something else now, girl. And I went out and I had like a great day and like I did a bunch of like just girly things. It was great. I had a great day. But it was one of those things where you would come and just like hang out in the neighborhood. You would like walk over to each other's house. You would take a walk in the neighborhood. And that's not life, especially for those of us that have focused in our, our careers. We live in we live in different countries for fuck's sake. You know, what am I supposed to do? Even my family's like, when are you going to come see us? And I was like, yeah, well, that's like a $3,000 commitment, maybe 4000 because I'm gonna have to get an Airbnb probably. You know what I mean? So like $4,000 to have a cup of coffee with you? Everybody relax. I feel like you're gonna put stress on this relationship for no reason. Which says just have coffee over a video call. I mean, obviously, right? Like just have coffee over the video call. 
Which is possible, but I think even the need to schedule it gives people anxiety. Like, why don't you have more time to talk to me? Well, then also maybe it's not a vibe. Like, don't you ever just go like some time without talking to certain people because you're like, uh, I don't really want the vibe from them right now because like they're such a unique person that it's like, I don't want banana right now. Like, I love all my friends, but sometimes I don't want to talk to them because sometimes I, that's not the vibe. I want to talk to a different friend, you know, because sometimes you're like you're doing something in your own life and you're like, I love you, but I want to talk to this friend right now because the thing I'm like mulling over, this friend will be better conversationally with. And I know that sounds like offensive, but like, I'm sorry. If when we talk, you're not giving me the thing I'm looking for. And right now I'm doing this thing. That's why you have different friends to do different things with. Because everyone has their own unique perspective. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 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 dun.